30th in one report. So we'll have all that in just the one report that's due July 30th. So we'll give you 30 days after the end of um, those dollars. And then we'll figure out, probably we'll just try to move to a quarterly report unless we have some, some requirement. We were told early on that we needed to report monthly. Now we're not convinced that that's the truth. So we'll find out if that's true, but we don't want you having to report if you don't, if we don't need it. So that's, oh, and I will resend the template out to everybody. That's no problem at all. So any other, I'm just looking at the chat here. Any other questions about that piece? I just want to tell everyone I just hit record. Oh, so we are recording thank now. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Um, what else? Other, um, and Anne, I, I know um, we can talk a little bit about this in the budget too, but we're also waiting patiently um, for our coordinated um, enrollment um, grant as well, which also we understand is with DOJ. So that is hopefully, um, they are quite aware of our timelines um, and that we are now past the date. So of course, like KPI and everything else, it will be back set um, appropriately to the date. So, so everybody knows that um, piece. And then, um, and we can talk about the money parts, what we do and don't know um, when we get to the budget um, piece, or I could just dive into that now and then let's just do that. And then Cash, you can do the room update just to make it easy. Um, so budget wise, you know, we just finished the session. So we are still in the throes of figuring out what everything um, looks like. I think as you all know and saw in the legislative update since Troy couldn't join us today, um, it was an exciting and another fabulous um, biennium for early learning. Um, the thing I'm really stoked about is that we are getting our $1.4 million that was a proposed cut in the governor's budget is coming back. Good job to all of you and your advocate um, on all sides for that and we are still um, working with the leadership team on um, how those dollars will be allocated, but our plan is that likely it will just go back into the coordination pot. What that means for the adjustments that we made, that's what we're going to need to look at. So um, I don't have a definitive answer um, on what that looks like, but your budgets, um, you can just expect that whatever was in your current budget that we gave you several months ago um, with the uh, draft grant, you're gonna have at least that much plus whatever else it looks like with the additional return of the 1.4 million. We will not be reinstating um, the school readiness fund. We are still moving towards more money for capacity. So that 1.4 million um, will move to the coordination bucket under the funding formula. And like I said, we just need to figure out what it means to some of the adjustments that we had um, previously um, made. Other dollars, um, Anna, do you wanna talk just for a second about the what we know about coordinated enrollment? Yeah, sure. So um, the uh, agreements are with DOJ, like Denise said. Um, as far as funding levels go, um, we're looking at kind of current service levels continuing into this year. It will be a combination again of preschool development grant funds um, and SSA dollars. Um, what we uh, don't know yet is if we'll be able to um, pull the SSA dollars into this first one or if we'll move forward on PDG and then amend later with SSA, but you can assume an overall budget of, um, of at least your current um, amount as we work through. And um, I am um, hearing that they are the, the top priority to get reviewed knowing that we're, um, we are behind um, and into our next grant period now. Um, and uh, as soon as we have more info about that, um, we'll be sending them your way. That's great, thank you. And then remember that current service level, I think it's around 3%. We're in the same bucket with um, KPI is also um, gonna be at current service level. So one again, once we know what those exact numbers are from Lois, we'll have that information by um, our August um, meeting. So we'll have that information out to you um, guys then, as well as any of the other um, funding streams that are coming um, our way that will have, uh, you'll, that'll be of interest. Um, um, to you. And there's a question in about the preschool promise providers receive summer contracts. She says we'll have to um, find out from programs. So we'll give an update on that as we find out more about that um, as well. And we're going to talk today, you probably noticed on the agenda, a little bit about some other um, dollars and grants that are happening um, through the division uh, coming up as well. So I think that's it for budget stuff. Unless there's any other questions, we'll move to a room update with Cass. 
Hey, Denise, I have a really quick tangential question. Sure. Is there, can we, um, can we get a copy of the updated hub scope of work before the contract comes out? Just because we're going to start doing work planning early August and would love to just have a final-ish copy of that. Yep. As soon as, where it is, just so you're aware, is um, it is still with ODE. In fact, I just talked to um, Ivan this morning about it, that it needs to move to DOJ this month. Um, so no changes have been made to this point um, since our last conversation. I know I re you may recall there was like a, rep there was one section that accidentally got repeated in the bottom. So there's like some cleanup that way, but I am hopeful, um, those of you that remember Sonia, she's actually at ODE now and working on our, um, working actually on our grant. So once I get through a conversation with her to see what changes she have, and then I can send that to you all before we get any DOJ um, pieces as well. But we expect to have all that in August from them. But I'm happy to send anything that's helpful to you now. Thank you, appreciate yep. that. Thanks for asking. And Begonia, is that the same template that you were asking for too, or is that different in the chat box? If you're looking for the KPI reporting template, I assume. Yeah, that is that is correct. Okay. okay. And but but um, the uh, with the scope of work and the contract, they were supposed to be also attached a few templates. So are they also gonna come at the same time as the uh, SOW now, or we have to wait until we get the contract? Yeah, it'll be it'll be before the contract because I know you'll want to um, start sharing it with subcontractors. But we are working on the templates, and we'll want to take some feedback um, from all of you. So we'll send that out um, as well before we finalize um, whatever the whatever the reporting um, templates are going to look like. So we'll make improvements, obviously, to what there is now. I don't expect it looks um, hugely different, but. Um, Certainly, anything that we um, make changes to will we'll take feedback prior to it being finalized. All right. Sorry, Denise. Um, can you say when you'll be uh, getting wanting feedback on the reporting templates? I missed that part. Oh yeah, probably in August. Once we okay. get once it gets to DOJ review, and I feel like we're in good shape with. Um, with that, then we'll finalize the um, finalize what the reporting templates are going to look like. That'll come with the you know for October. Great, thank yeah. you. Yep. No problem. All right, all righty. More to come. We'll keep rolling along. And um, uh, the other thing, just so you're aware, I think we've mentioned before, we are trying to um, hopefully have some, uh, money and a plan to work, um, deeper with Aaron Watson, um, in the coming, um, months to be able to help us to develop some of those bigger templates, um, like what the original assessment is going to look like. And as we mentioned, she'll help us with the shared measurement work, um, and we'll be formatting, forming a work group, um, to do that too. So we're still in process of what all that looks like now that, um, session is over. So more to come as we work through that, um, as well. All right, Cass, I'm going to take it away on a room update. Thank you. Um, may I have the option to share my screen, please, real quick? I think I might be able to already. OK, um, just real quick, everyone. Good afternoon. And it's been a while since I've given a room update. So I wanted to share something that the CDC, the Center for Disease and Control Prevention, um, partnered, partnered with Vroom recently on. Um, they created an app called the Milestone Tracker that's available on both Google and Apple platforms to help track a child's developmental progress by looking for important milestones and kind of highlighting those. And Vroom helped them create this poster that you see on the screen um, to kind of support some you know, to provide some tips and activities that would support the child's development at each of these um, age indicators. Um, and I wanted to just share it real quick. Last week I shared uh, via email one on equity that was done with the University of Washington, some um, tips that were aligned with some practices with that and some work that they're doing. Um, this one happens to be in multiple languages and there's a lot of other um, free resources and materials that the CDC provided um, to kind of go along 
with this poster as well as promoting the new app. So I just really wanted to make sure and take a moment to share with you. And in the chat box, I uploaded the poster itself as well as the links to the CDC where um, this information is posted in different languages as well as the Vroom website so you can have it handy at the same time. Um, if there's any questions about that, I'd be happy to um, take those. And if not, thank you for letting me have a little bit of your time today. All right, any questions? Hey, Cass, will you drop that? Um, oh, you did, sorry. See, I just wanted to say hi to you, that's all. <laughs> oh, I love when you get to say hi to me. So yeah, of course. And I can email them out to you after the meeting when um, I can send them to Aaron when he sends out the recording and stuff like that too. If you guys would like, happy to. Perfect. Uh huh. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So Carmen, is John with us? He's our next presenter on the prices right here. He's not. And Andy and I have arranged for Andy to go next instead of John. Perfect. All right. So Andy is going to um, be talking to us today about, I'm looking on the agenda, <laughs> the state of emergency recovery phase in child care. Take it away, Andy. Hi, everybody. So um, we wanted to take a couple minutes and check in uh, around um, just making sure everybody has the most up-to-date information on where we are at as we move from really our state of emergency to our state of recovery and transitioning out in terms of licensing and what that means for childcare providers. And so I think what I want to try and do, and everybody bear with me because I have a new laptop has been ordered for me. And so I'm going to try and share my screen, but in order to do that, I have to un plug so just one sec if i disappear i'm still here I'm just doing all okay uh and so i'm going to try and and share um let's see do, do, do. press the green button press this one press this one technology is fun this is why we're transitioning out can people see slides on my screen yes Great. Okay. Phew. I'm telling you, like this was like even in college, like just the fact that I had to use technology always stressed me out. But we're gonna <laughs> do this. So we're entering a new this new chapter in our COVID recovery. And um, full disclosure, I in no matter how many hats I wear, I uh, do not wear the hat of, of working over at OCC. I worked very closely with them, but I could never replace Tammy Scott who really is the expert on all of this. So um, I am happy to be the messenger with this information. And I'm also happy to take back any questions to her that maybe we, we still wanna wrestle with and think about a little bit. Um, but what I'd like to just make sure that I mention is that um, moving forward in an effective June 29th, there were some changes in terms of how programs are identified within the system. And so as you remember, um, originally, uh, Back, back in 2020 when we had to move into the emergency child care or ECC, uh, programs were asked to uh, apply for that uh, and, and were approved to be an ECC program so that they could remain um, open and in operation during uh, our state of emergency. So effective June 29th, uh, ECC applications are no longer um, required uh, and are no longer being processed as we tra start transitioning away from those. So um, what that means means is if you are a licensed center um, or a certified family, registered family, you're not need, you, that approval is not needed in order for you to um, continue. You would just go back to what you were doing before and using that same license. Um, so there are those health and safety standards that are very COVID specific. Those have been moved to advisory. Uh, they are not required anymore. And they're in fact, uh, not something that OCC has um, regulated authority over. They're really from um, the health authority. And so some programs may be asked to continue to work with their local health authority around those advised uh, health and safety standards. Um, but we will uh, continue to look forward to using our um, the OCC licensing regs that are in place currently and um, using those and the rule, those, those rules moving forward. 
Um, so if you are a temporary unlicensed ECC, also commonly referred to as a pop-up, which makes it sound very hipster, um, those can continue through August 31st, um, and they must continue to use the health and safety checklist that has been provided to them. Uh, OCC is working very closely with a lot of these programs to help move them towards uh, becoming licensed if they want to continue to serve children and families through August 31st. So you may know of some of these programs. Um, and you may know of some of these programs that may be choosing not to continue after August 31st. And we wanna make sure that we um, are, are creating some warm handoffs for those families into new programs. And then you can also see here the recorded programs, uh, same thing. And then for EBC, which is the emergency background check that will continue through August 31st, um, but we have just, uh, discontinued accepting applications. And then again, um, OCC is working very closely with those who are have uh, EBC currently to um, help move them through the, the CBR system so that they can also be transitioned into regular operation. Um, there's a couple new temporary rules as, as part of our transition. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and continue to allow the use of hand sanitizer. Uh, Pre-COVID that was not allowed in classrooms, but um, we are allowing it now and they can continue to use it. Uh, CPR online certification is going to be continued to use through December 26. Um, to continue to use it past that date would require a permanent rule change, which um, Tammy will be going to the Early Learning Council and requesting and expects that to be approved. Uh, and so the, the, that is the plan is to continue to allow uh, those, those CBR, CPR online certifications to stand until they expire and then the additional allowances for the A2 qualifications and supervision. Um, so this just again talks a little bit about the difference between what's required and OHA has authority over not um, licensing. And so programs are still asked to do that, uh, but there are some other recommendations there uh, around face covering, stable groups, hand washing uh, and the such. And then a little bit more information on the emergency background check. I know that in some communities, um, this is something that people are paying very close attention to, especially because we know that our CBR process sometimes creates uh, more delays than we would uh, uh, like in our system. Um, and that affects all aspects of the systems. We have folks at the ELD who haven't been able to start their positions because their CBR is also hung up. So uh, they're really working on how they can help um, use help people who have the emergency background check transition into a, a CBR and continue working. Um, so our goal is to really create as little of a disruption there as possible. So um, creating this conditional enrollment boost um, will help uh, uh, provide that. And I think those really all uh, of the updates around that um, to share. There's definitely more information on the ELD website and I can even drop that link in if that's helpful. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing now so I can see everybody's face again and see if there's any hands raised or questions in the chat. I see no hands or questions and I see John is here. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. All right. So, John, I got to keep going back and forth to my agenda here. Okay, so if there's no um, questions, thank you so much um, for that. Andy, very exciting, finally, that we are moving um, away from um, from the um, state of emergency. So, um, John, are you ready to give us a legislative update on SB 236 and HB 2166? Can I, uh, is there an agenda item you can do just prior to that? Um, I've got a little chaos going on in my background right now, and I want to uh, make sure that is done before okay. I kick in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Denise, do you want me to just talk about the uh, learning collaborative a bit here? That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, apologies everyone today is very much like a, here's a whole bunch of information update kind of meeting with um, not a lot of space for, for back and forth. You're obviously always welcome to chime in with questions and things, but uh, just wanting to recognize that there's a lot of just listening and processing today. So we'll try to take a couple little mini breaks too, to make sure our brains are keeping up. 
Um, so I wanted to just take a minute today to check in with folks on the learning collaborative draft agenda that went out last week. Hopefully people have had a chance to look at it. It is attached to the invite to this meeting and I can put it up also right now, assuming that I can find it. Um, Kelly, the learning collab is going to be virtual this year. Um, I know we are open, open for business across the state, but we didn't know how soon that would happen. So we figured we should just keep it virtual, know that we can keep it virtual and then plan to be in person next time. So um, I'll share that in a second, but just wanting to kind of set the stage because we did the learning collaborative planning team once we figured out who we wanted to be in this room with us in the room. I'm going to keep saying that. And I do keep meeting virtually. Um, we, we kept putting in the agenda things that would help us lay the groundwork for having a shared understanding of what's already happening with childcare supply building across the state. So wanting to like look at case studies, wanting to look at the childcare desert data that's available, looking at data tools around that. Um, considering what ELD plans are, are in the works, what funding is happening, if there's legislation that goes into it. And honestly, like as we started putting that all in there in the agenda for two days and then started adding in like, wow, this is a lot of different people in the room. We need to make sure that we're understanding what all of these different groups are, are investing and what their goals are and what their lens is on this. We realized that that in itself is is about two days. So um, I hope that you will be in agreement that it is worth the investment of time and energy to do that groundwork building and have that joint foundational understanding um, as well as the relationship building that is necessary. As you know, we're inviting early intervention agency leaders and a variety of early learning tribal leaders to the conversation. And so particularly with those two groups, <laughs> um, with those two groups being there, it's not that those are new partners to us, but they're for some people, they're going to be new partners, new think partners in terms of building the child care supply. So we want to make sure that we're really understanding what everyone in the room brings to the table and what their goals are so that we're up to date on that and we're able to bring everyone all, be all together as we move forward. Um, so the agenda is, is set on building that foundation. That does not mean that we're not going to um, ever get to the things that we talked about that you've identified as being really important in building supply, such as um, you know recruiting and retaining staff, having more pathways, career pathways, including pathways that include those who prefer a language other than English. Um, those are really important. And so our plan is to actually have this learning collaborative be the first in a series of collaborative times that we'll spend together with um, the CCR directors and others on the child care supply building piece. Um, sorry, there's a cat decided you need to join me. Um, yeah, so I'll put that up there. I'll share for a minute so people can see if you haven't had a chance and we could take any questions. Um, if you are like me, it can be really hard to um, take that pause sometimes <laughs> to assess where we are. And we're all, I mean, we're here because we're problem solvers. Everyone in this room is like that, right? Like we want to like take information and synthesize it and start moving forward. But I think that we can all agree that, especially when we're trying to make equitable decisions, that, that pause is important. So um, I think it might feel a little bit strange for us to spend so much time in laying groundwork, but I know our team feels confident that, that is gonna pay off. So I hope that others will come out of it feeling the same way too. Carmen, are you open for a question? Yes, I am open for questions. I'm trying to pull up the draft agenda for people who haven't seen it, but I am also taking questions. Um, so in, in look at the, are, is the ELD, are you guys inviting like 
our EIECSE partners and the CCRNR partners. So mm -hmm. you guys are handling that invitation, right? Mm -hmm. Do we then, you know, because there might be a couple staff that I want to have um, participate in parts. I think I remember reading that that's an okay thing to do. Is that right? Yeah, so we have sent the invitation to this and this same agenda and invite just went out um, either Thursday or Friday, and that included um, a prompt to for you and for the CCR and our directors to bring up to four people from your organization. Um, and I'm hopeful that you can use the draft agenda to maybe get a sense of who it is you would want in the room with you for this conversation and moving forward. Um, and then the early intervention, um, early childhood special education regional agency directors have been invited. I believe that they are not they are not bringing additional staff. It is just one person from each agency. And then there's another set of tribal leaders who are invited and some of them will be bringing additional staff and partners as well. So we're handling all of those like sort of the the first level of invite at each agency and then it's up to who you who you bring with you. And Carmen, I was just going to say the nice thing about the virtual format, we're still working on getting that through our IT department. We're hoping to use WOVA, which they used for the parent, um, the OPEC conference. So thank you for to CAS for bringing that to us. But the nice thing is with this, so many people, we can really um, host um, a great number of people. And um, we're really thinking about this. The, the reason I, of course, wanted to be in person is no surprise to any of you. Um, but I think what's exciting about utilizing this format is that we're going to be able to um, do a little bit of practicing on our end too about how could in the future we do an in person that has an online format included um, in it. Um, which we think is really um, giving us a higher level of equity in starting to have parents participate and others that wouldn't be able to come in person, but still be able to be part of it. And those of you that recall the very early days of us trying to do in person, the last one we did, I think was from Burns in person with trying to um, also be on <laughs> the phone. It just didn't work. So we gave that up. So we're hopeful that this will um, allow us to do so. And there will be a platform on this for registration once we get um, once we get the software in place. Can I say, ugh, hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about this. Um, and I, cause I, I love the, the nature of the cross sector stuff. I mean, I think that's who we are as hubs, right? Like that's our gig. So it sounds really cool. Um, um, I'm, I'm, my, I'm worried because of the online format, kind of like you were saying, Denise, it seems like it's so much easier when you're in person to kind of feel like you've left the thing having accomplished something and that you can like put your finger on a deliverable. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if either you or Carmen would be willing to speak to like, what are your highest hopes for coming out of this? Because it seems like with r &Rs and with hubs, like we've been having these conversations, but it's, and I think they're helpful because I think we all start to hear the same things and we're all starting to kind of get on a page together. Is that kind of the, the same goal with this where we're just starting to engage a conversation? Because I can say in my community that sometimes the EIEC, EIECSE, even just regionally is highly complex. And when you add that factor into this broader context of all the early learning hubs and all the RNRs now, it just feels like in a word, it has the potential to be fairly fraught. And so I'm just, it seems to me, this is an, I'm having an anxiety attack, just a little one, like to know, clearly what is our hope or what is our goal or what are we trying to get out of this conversation and I'm, I'm sincere I hope you feel that from me yeah no I appreciate that Krista and I know that you're sincere um <laughs> so I, the goal is to come out with a shared understanding of where we are 
and where different parts of our sector would like for us and or need us to go, including like this piece here on the 11th with early learning updates and goals from tribal representatives, like as we move forward, making sure that those voices are part of our conversation. Um, and in terms of early, in terms of early intervention, I know that, you know, everyone's relationship is different across the state and by region and hub, but I think that it's really important for them, for us to be in the room together so that they can hear like what we were thinking about and talking about in terms of building supply and what is needed in order to have inclusive community programs. Um, and that we can hear what's happening for them in terms of their supply building and as they're adding, they're making plans and have their own funding for adding um, early intervention services that we can all be thinking within a sh kind of a shared framework, if that makes sense. And I, and I do think that there is, I think that there is space, there is probably a bunch of tension there, but I don't think that we, I know that you're not like afraid of that tension, so I don't mean to imply that, but I, I appreciate you recognizing that because I think that there can be conflict yeah. around that, but I think that we need it all in, we need it all in the room and in the conversation in order to start working through that because while there is more funding coming into early childhood education, we're, we still need to be able to leverage and pull all of the levers that we have in order to make the most of what we've got. Yeah. Can I follow up real quick and then I'll, yeah. and then I'll defer to other folks. Um, what, so that helps me um, and I'm grateful for it. Um, when you say where we are, do you mean like each element of the sector? Like where are hubs? Where is r, &R? Where is EIECSC? Or do you mean like where the early learning division is or the new early learning entity in relationship to the many arms that are a part of the sector? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I'm speaking in the large we of like the early learning system, but I but I also mean those smaller pieces. Um, so like, for example, this is an important piece that um, this like biennium forecast happening on Tuesday morning, that piece, you know, when I was talking to Alyssa Chatterjee the other day, that was really important to her. And she specifically asked like, if she could, if we could please include a piece where we can present like what's what is the larger work of the ELD in terms of priorities in the next two years and then what pieces of that are specific to childcare supply building and where that where that would come in um so I guess yes and yes <laughs> is my answer I do mean all those pieces okay I, last comment, and this yeah. is a comment, not a question. Yeah. One of the things that Miriam did for me when she came to the early learning division year, like however many years ago it's been, is really like help me see how, and I think she probably did this for all of us. I'm just speaking from my own experience that like we really needed that extra petal in that flower when we were talking about sectors, which was to incorporate this whole other element of um, actual programming for lack of a better word, um, whether that's preschool promise or state funded preschool, I mean, whatever it is, that was a really important part that wasn't around in the kids opera era when we were talking about there's $2 billion being invested across all the state sectors and all we need to do is align and coordinate and we'll get to better outcomes. And Miriam said, well, actually, we really need to focus on some additional funding for infrastructure for this animal too. So let's like be real about that. One of the things that would be helpful to me in preparing for this learning collaborative is having a sense of where is this EI thing like fitting in? Like back in the day, EI was an important connection between health, CCO, and developmental screenings and our doctors. And it's complicated because they're also part of this K-12 collaborative, which we're always trying to navigate, which in and of itself is complex. So I just, I think it's important for me just in thinking about this collaborative and adding all of these people, we're, we are bringing into the room hosts of complexity. And as much as I appreciate like the, the broad goal of it, 
I feel concerned if we're not really a little bit focused about some achievable goal that we can get to by the end of the collaborative. Otherwise, it could go sideways for a lot of us really fast. And so I, I just want to be as clear and honest about that and also hopeful and willing to assist in thinking about what that kind of a goal could be and how we could engage that that effort more meaningfully. So thank you for letting me talk and I'm sorry to colleagues for going on and on as much as I have. Um, Kelly, Kelly and then Bess. I put a question in the chat box just asking about uh, um, about having one person per screen on on the uh, virtual. So I don't know if that is um, part of your plan or not. We had probably a 30 minute conversation at our board meeting talking about how we were going to move forward with our board meetings because we've learned so much in this virtual platform. And it was um, I was surprised at the um, energy from my board members in saying they do not want a mix of people in a room and um, people virtual in one meeting. You're either all virtual, one face per screen or in person. It's not equitable. You don't equally hear voices. You don't equally see a person's face and their expressions and their um, tone. Um, and I could say this because uh, you know, you all know that I work really closely with Teresa Martinez and her staff. They have an awesome little conference room where two or three people can sit at a table with this ginormous screen. And um, even with two or three people where we can see them, it's terrible. And, um, and I, and uh, anyway, really strong, really strong opinions. And I won't be able to have my, I, I won't be able to, anyway, never mind. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I think that the goal is that there's always everyone in the same format, right? Like we either we're all in, a, in an actual room or we're all in a virtual space with the hybrid availability for if people choose or for whatever extent, like extenuating circumstance are not able to be there. It's pretty difficult as a facilitator <laughs> to facilitate anything that's part in person and part online. Um, so our goal is not like we're moving toward doing things intentionally hybrid. Um, Being the person from Eastern Oregon that attends state meetings or provides testimony to yeah. uh, meetings that are in Salem, um, I am um, a, a spot, a, a fly in the room. Um, I am not equally present with the people in the room. I get to say my message, it's fine, but it's not equitable and it's not, um, it doesn't, it, it's not fair to my families that I'm representing. Yeah, I agree, Kelly. I think, I mean, I've been in those meetings with you before where it's like everyone's talking and then after 30 minutes, someone's like, oh God, Kelly's on the phone. Like Kelly, <laughs> We, we need your voice. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. Denise, were you going to chime in too? Yeah, no, I was going to say, I agree. Having been in meetings with people when there's three people in a room and you're on the computer and it, it's just nearly impossible. And I think what I, you know, when we were saying about having a hybrid thing for the future, it's like, how do we have accessibility for people if they really can't participate in person is what we're interested in. And as far as like a one per screen on this, it's gonna be important that each person is in their own screen and in a, by themselves or whatever that looks like because we're gonna have breakout sessions, right? Because with a size of group this large, there's no way we're doing the whole conference together. So things will be in breakouts and there'll be small groups and you'll be in regional groups together with your partner. So I definitely um, am in favor of don't do that with four of you in a conference room. <laughs> It's not going to work. All right, Bess, I think you're up next. Thanks. Um, I was just, I've got a couple of people that are coming from, well, that I'm considering inviting from, uh, well, one is a Lane County Commissioner and the other is um, an Economic Development Director for the City of Springfield and the City of Florence. And there's growing interest in Lane County around pulling together. 
economic development folks and people from our chamber and like the business community has peaked interest in the topic of childcare. I could talk about some of the equity issues involved in that and that's another topic, but just want to acknowledge that that's, um, I think, I think they finally got it on their radar that it's kind of a big deal that they that child care supply gets addressed in communities and that they have a part to play. So I was just really curious, um, given the agenda about where you think um, folks like that might plug in, uh, where it makes the most sense for them to attend and or if it does at all, um, because otherwise I'd invite I'd invite others, but just have had some um, some real interest in that. And so wanted to just get your perspective on on where that they might fit in. One last thing and then I'll, sorry to belabor this. Um, it, I think it would be great so that I know who I should invite from my, my team and partners. Um, because right now, just looking at how this is laid out, I may actually invite a couple of different people for different times and different portions. If it's not too much trouble, what it would be amazing is uh, for each of the sections to have just sort of an, an overview of an objective that you have for those sections so that I can make sure I've got the best people at the, at the team. Yeah, that would be great. Great suggestion. But any input on that, on my question? I mean, I, it's fine if it hadn't been thought about or nobody really has a good um, answer pulled together. That's totally fine. It's just, I was just curious if, if that has been brought up at all. Carmen, do you want to? I think I've lost your question, Beth, sorry. There was two, um, several things I, in a row and I just lost track of what it was, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I have folks from my uh, county commissioner, economic development folks from local cities interested in this conversation. I've thought about inviting them. I don't know if there's a good place in the agenda where they might join or if it's not really a conversation for them at that level. Yes, and to Renee's point, regional workforce folks. Does I that make sense, Carmen? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And I, I do think so, yes. Yes, Bess, I, I don't, Carmen, I don't know what your thought, I mean, we've had some conversation internally about part of, you know, looking at the work that you all will be doing with CCR and ours to do, you know, supply building, things that are already happening, we know um, in many of your regions in Central and South Coast, in Lynn Benton Lincoln, um, where you're working with the business community and economic development, et cetera. Um, and that's, you know, some of the, I think, uh, session ideas that we have is having those conversations about pulling those sectors in. So I think as we start to develop the sessions a little bit more, um, this is really an outline for you all to see where we're going and what we're thinking about. Um, that will make more sense in the next couple of weeks. Okay. I don't Great. really see it. Yeah, I don't, I agree with that. And I don't really see a place in anywhere in here where it's inappropriate for them to be Great. like our, our goal is to create this agenda so that it is informative to everyone who would be in the room and creates like a big picture. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think that there's going to be any wrong place for them to be. Okay. Yep. That's great. And I'll just add to what Begonia mentioned in the chat to this to the last conversation we were having about hybrid meetings. Um, we, I just went through a trauma-informed facilitation training. Um, and one of the things that they talked about when you're facilitating meetings, you have to be mindful of, of course, the power dynamics involved. And that can be positional power, right? People's positions, titles. But I think in the case of having a hybrid meeting, there's like physical power of being in person versus being remote and just speak to Kelly's point that there's, um, it creates obvious inequities in that. And I just wanna be cognizant, like also listening can be helpful for people too. So just wanna acknowledge that that's a tricky thing, but that there is, uh, it's not necessarily a trauma-informed approach to have a hybrid meeting 
um, in that way. So I'll just add my two cents to that. But thank you for all that consideration and appreciate you guys uh, pulling this together. Thank you, Bess. Um, I just, I wanted to add a comment from earlier um, about your questions, Krista, and um, you know, what Carmen was saying about building really what I think of as a roadmap. And it's really, you know, um, in response to the feedback that we took from you guys from a couple months ago, I think it might've been in a community of practice that we first brought um, the idea of the agenda together and really that we wanted to focus on supply building is the um, really for our first time in a learning collaborative, except for what we did with coordinated enrollment the last time we were together in person, but really to focus on one specific issue and get really deep um, into it. And I think it's something that Molly said, um, which is where I think it brought us to, which is we don't want to turn into starting to do a bunch of new things. We really need the lay of the land and to know what the roadmap is and what everyone is doing. So we all have the same clear understanding of what's happening in the system before we can take action. And you all know I'm very action oriented. So when we like made this decision internally, I was like, well, there has to be some action at least the end of day two, something, something <laughs> to be the next step piece. So I just think this idea of mapping and really being clear and then um, being able to look at like what's the right place from there is, is what we're trying to accomplish through this learning collaborative. And it's certainly a different format and way of being. And so, um, but pretty exciting because developmentally, I think this is the right place for us to be. So, all right, well, I'm gonna look at the chat. If we don't have other questions, we can move on to our next. Um, Denise, this is Christy, and I, oh, yeah. I wanna add one more. Um, yeah. I'm gonna make the assumption that you're gonna be recording each of the sessions individually, not as one overall. Yeah. And I can think of like, I have my a, a regional group around childcare supply building that there would be many people interested in participating, but actually being able to share the recordings with them after the fact versus trying to get everybody in the room together all in the same time when this is just a month away. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, and I believe, Cass, you could probably speak more to this than we can on the capabilities, but I have, I have no doubt, having now been in a few online conferences, that is, that is a capability of our um, of the format we're going to be using. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So, and thank you for the, um, the comments and I appreciated the um, conversation just to say about the um, trauma informed facilitation. I'd actually like to see like where we could get that training. I'm very interested in that. It'd be a cool thing for us to offer um, to each other as well. And to think about how how is a way for us to make the meetings um, accessible to more people in the future? And you know, trying to do a mixed might not be the, the way to do it, but um, we'll look forward to um, your input and advice on that as we see how the, a full online one goes for us this first time um, around. So, okay, so with that- Wait, Can I just oh. say one more thing? I, I, I wanna make sure to, to call this out because I think it's really important. Um, that this practice of like taking this big pause and getting like all the, all, like a lot of voices in the room and, and hearing from them and really like letting that like sit with us as we get ready to like take action is something that is really key to like our equity goals. And our team at ELD, like we went to our, we brought in voices from our equity team to the learning collaborative planning session. And they are very enthusiastic as ELD staff on that team and people of color for us to use this practice. Like they were like, that actually makes a ton of sense that you would spend a bunch of time like knowing where we are and like bringing in tribal leaders and making sure that we're all on the same page before we go forward, that people who are advocating for children with disabilities have a big voice in the room. So um, I just wanna call that out because I know it's something that we've all been saying that we wanna do together. And I think that this is a place where we really have opportunity to, to do that in a big way. Um, and know that like, yeah, we do need to set goals and, they, and they, we do need to be on the same page and we do need to start implementing plans, but we also really need to make sure that we've got everyone included. 
before we go forward with those plans. So just want to call that out because this is a, a big opportunity to do some this in a really equitable way. Thank you, Carmen. Okay, <laughs> nice comment, Pess. All right, so John Reeves, are you feeling like you're in a good spot to talk about legislation? Oh, goodness, if it isn't uh, the whole family trying to exit out the door, um, my wife was also packing to leave for a couple of weeks. Um, she's going to Maui, I'm staying here. Um, I think we all know where I'd rather be uh, is on a vacation like that. Uh, but with, you know, she's going to go with a couple of friends, lifelong friends, big deal. So um, uh, excited for her, but uh, all heck broke loose in the hallway outside the other room. So I appreciate you guys transitioning a little bit with me. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief overview. How much time do you guys want me to talk? Because I know you may have some other things. Uh, is... We're looking at our agenda and you are last. A little. Oh no, you have two more. We have two. We have the child care stabilization grants and yours. So, um, okay. and we've got about 25 minutes left. So how about you okay. give us about 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, I'll try and do 10, 10, 15. Okay, so Senate Bill 236 and House Bill 2166, uh, both dealing with aspects of um, preventing suspension and expulsion. And so just super excited. Uh, to just start with, because this is, uh, I think, a massive leap in the right direction in terms of supporting our early education programs and actually uh, also supporting children to be maintained in environments um, and that all children belong in early care and education environments that are of high quality. And so just putting that at the forefront, I think we've done a lot of things that have been stop go, stop go over the years that have been similar to, you know, mental health consultation projects and other things, but there hasn't been anything that puts it into um, law or rule or, or any other way that it embeds it in so that it's um, ongoing and long lasting. And so um, just as we talk about these couple of bills, I, I think it's pretty unprecedented the, the place that we're at. Uh, uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna start with the one uh, it, that in my mind um, requires the other one to exist for, for it to work. So I'm gonna start with Senate Bill 236, which is the one that has a mandate that there will be a ban on suspension and expulsion practices by July 1, 2026. So any program that receives state uh, public funding from the Early Learning Division, so any certified or registered uh, programs um, would, uh, would, would not be able to suspend or expel children any further after that date. And in that bill, um, we're required, the division is required to do a study on the use in, of suspension and expulsion in early care and education programs. And so that would be, you know, thinking about all of the various ways that that's practiced. Um, sometimes it's uh, other types of exclusionary practices, not necessarily an out and out suspension or an expulsion. Sometimes it's taking breaks. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it was mentioned at the CCRNR meeting earlier today, the, um, the practice where um, a program has like a trial enrollment period or something like that uh, for children. And then they say, well, it's not working out. All those things have to be discussed in the study. Um, and then we have to, um, in that same uh, report, show the efforts to reduce and prevent the use of suspension and expulsion in early care and education programs. And that one's due in uh, uh, September of 2024. And then um, we also have a requirement prior to that in July 1, 2022 in that bill where we need to um, uh, submit the uh, recommendations for how we'll do implementation of the ban. So that's July, 2022. Um, and that requires us to, to be able to describe the investigatory or enforcement process and any recommendations for the legislature on how we would handle a program that might suspend or expel um, a, a child and what, what practice uh, the state will take in order to investigate that or 
um, or look into it and what uh, ramifications that has. And so this bill, Senate Bill 2036, was championed by uh, Black Child Development PDX and the Children's Institute. Um, this was not an ELD um, uh, budget bill. It doesn't have any um, uh, support system sort of attached to it as far as, you know, outside of doing this kind of report and the ban going into effect. And so that's why I said it's really, it feels to me that it, it really relies upon this House Bill 2166 to be a, a component of supports uh, to wrap around this, because if we just out and out ban uh, suspension and expulsion, but don't provide any sort of uh, uh, supports, resources, and and uh, and and opportunities for programs to seek some help, um, then we're you know we're we're clearly not going to be able to um, maintain children in those programs any better uh, with with just layering a requirement on it. And so, um, and I'm going to move into uh, House Bill 2166 which uh, was at just prior to session was, uh, it came out of the governor's racial justice council. It was in the governor's budget uh, before it went into the bill. And the bill is uh, essentially establishing the early childhood suspension and expulsion prevention program uh, at the early learning division. And so this is gonna be a statewide system uh, for early education programs and it's really thinking about supporting the stable and inclusive child care environments for all children um, and, uh, and really focused on ensuring that children aren't um, subject to suspension and expulsion practices that we're really trying to uh, wrap around programs with some supports. And so uh, the, the bill itself um, had $5.8 million in it. And that is actually for the second year of the biennium. So what would happen in future um, biennia is that that would be almost doubled, um, at least in this next, you know, 23, 25 period. And um, uh, the, the idea with the 5.8 million was to allow us to um, be able to put, you know, structures into place and get the regional uh, set up, put together so that we could have uh, infant and early childhood mental health consultants in communities around the state. And so that's why it kind of kicks off with the 5.8 in the, in the second year. Um, I won't go into immense detail, but there was, there was a, a lot of things that occurred between the formulation of that budget and, and how it landed. And uh, at one point there was no uh, staff support at the division level and, um, and the 5.8 million was gonna be what we got in perpetuity uh, for all biennia. And uh, the governor's office actually did a nice last minute um, uh, convening with um, our legislative fiscal office and the uh, committee at the legislature that was working on it. And, and uh, we're able to help people understand that that was just a one year investment. So that was really exciting, I would call it in the 11th hour of, of all this. So the bill also creates a warm line. Um, and what we mean by a warm line is an opportunity for um, our early care and education providers to call a, uh, you know, a physical line and seek technical assistance uh, when their teachers are feeling like they're struggling to support a child uh, in maintaining their placement in their program. And so the, the warm line uh, really is something, well, I'll talk about it a little bit, um, further in a minute. These are just the components of the bill. So we've got a warm line. We've got uh, the need or the, the component within the bill that says we'll build capacity in communities to deliver technical assistance. Uh, so we'll create a locally based uh, infant and early childhood mental health consultant um, cadre. So regionally based expertise across the entire state. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're headed towards that in a second. Um, and uh, then part of that bill also, um, this was this was this piece was coming into play when uh, we were trying to figure out how to ensure that providers would um, access a warm line and seek supports. Um, what was written into this bill was that. Um, early education providers would re be required to call the line for support. So instead of banning, you know, this was before these two things were now 
kind of attached and needing to rely upon each other. But instead of banning expulsion and, and uh, suspension, we were looking to um, uh, kind of front load this with your you're struggling, so let's have you seek help, but we're gonna make you seek help. You can't just, you know, avoid it. A um, Little different than a ban, but uh, also then helps connect them to uh, resources they may not have even known existed. Um, but now with the two things combined, um, really we, we, we need them contacting the line, we need them seeking support up front um, uh, because this whole idea that at some point um, they will not be allowed to, um, suspend or expel, they, they really need to be connected into the various resources. And so the whole goal of that program is really to think about ways to reduce uh, disparities in suspension and expulsion, and um, especially based on race, ethnicity, ability, and other protected classes. And I think that's um, really how we've been diving into the work that we've been moving into um, in anticipation of these bills. Um, and I wanted to talk just a tiny bit about that, um, but I'll pause just for a second to make sure there weren't any questions about either of those bills. And if you have questions on Senate Bill 236, I am going to defer to an expert in it who's not in the room. No, I don't know. There's nobody who, I, I can't defer. I, I'm making stuff up now, but um, if you have a question about it, I'll do my best to answer it. Looking in the chat. Nothing coming so far. Okay, I'll just keep going. Uh, so just in thinking of uh, <clears throat> the warm line a little bit, I just wanted to, um, it, it's interesting because we're, we're going through a parallel process. Also, um, our preschool development grant offered us some resources before we knew that the governor um, and the racial justice uh, council were going to prioritize this before we knew that there were uh, truly some grassroots efforts um, in the Multnomah area to bring forward Senate Bill 236. We were working towards, you know, how do we put together a model um, uh, and, and what would that look like um, in communities and what do we know already that exists? And so um, the preschool development grant, and some of you may have been on the interview circuit uh, for that. Um, our Portland State University partners have been doing quite a few interviews around the state, prioritizing um, getting to um, early childhood consultants of color that already exist in our communities. They've been interviewing national models um, that have backed their way into really ensuring that they're putting equity uh, first, but we've been really interested in the workforce implications and how uh, different states have really developed ways to ensure that they're recruiting and retaining uh, um, people of color in the positions um, you know that that are doing the mental health consult consultation around around their states. And so that process uh, in our PDG grant has allowed PSU to really engage quite a bit with. Um, uh, we'll, I'll call it uh, partners around the state to um, learn what's working well and what we may need to be doing in the in the future to build a, a program. But their goal is to propose a model for infant and early childhood mental health consultation uh, that Oregon will utilize uh, to decide how we have these regionally based consultants exist, what best recommended partner would potentially be the place where those uh, positions would be housed, um, what kind of a centralized structure there might be, what other partners should be in conversations about potentially funding a project like this. Um, we're required in the House Bill 2166, of course, to work with our Oregon Health Authority partners, which makes a ton of sense. Um, but I think there's a whole bunch of implications that we need to have some um, uh, good answers to around what this structure uh, could look like to be successful. So it, I feel like the hubs and the CCRNRs, our early intervention, early childhood special ed partners, um, behavioral health in, uh, in certain regions are doing some very interesting things, but we need to make this model a statewide model, but having enough 
flexibility regionally that it can incorporate be incorporated into existing efforts and and complement existing efforts and so anyway i can continue to talk and talk but that um that report and recommendations um where psu is now in the process of doing some engagement um with uh groups of uh, early educators that are early educators of color so um some some of the focused child care networks that are uh, primarily Spanish speaking providers or Russian speaking, uh, some networks um, that are working with our African American and black communities. Um, those are scheduled for July, um, so this month. And then portions of this report, or the report is going to be put together um, so that by the time we get to the fall, we can put it out for public comment so that uh, those of you who may, may have interacted with this process along the way can see what the final recommendations turn out to be and advise it a little bit more. Um, and so then the final report will be handed off to the division uh, by December. So you can see then that um, uh, one, of, one of the other things that comes into play with House Bill 2166 is that we have to report on our progress to the uh, legislature in this short session, so February of 22. And so this report is really um, leads leads us towards that legislative session. And then uh, that will give us access to the money to be then uh, creating these local um, mental health consultation opportunities. So that right now, all we have access to is some funding to get uh, three positions uh, at the early learning division, and then we'll hopefully get access to all of the money that would support the, the regional um, development of, of uh, these, um, these positions. And so those, of course, I shouldn't say of course, those were shooting for a July 1, uh, 22, you know, starting to phase in regions that are, are ready uh, for those opportunities. And that would kick off the the sort of second year of the biennium and the beginning of the, the mental health consultation. And before I take your question, Bess, I just wanted to say that we really are seeking ways that, um, you know, that the terminology I'm using with infant and early childhood mental health consultation is not accessible to anyone. Neither is suspension and expulsion prevention programs. They all sound awful um, in, in terms of terminology. So we really want to be thinking about and we have been hearing from different communities about how they view uh, similar types of activities that support children's social emotional development. And so we really, you know, we may have a name or a term uh, for what it means to us in the legislature, but I think we also want um, our regions to have ownership over this in a way that it can be um, accessible, not stigmatizing and all those kinds of things. So we're, we're trying to take that into account as we're going around and, and hearing from communities too. So uh, just want you to be aware that uh, we are aware that just the naming convention alone already starts to set up um, barriers and, and issues. So that that is not our intention and that um, won't be the, uh, the end result of this. We won't have people running around with their I-E-C-H-M-C-H tag on their shoulder. Anyway, so Bess, what was your question? I don't see why not. That that acronym is just so easy to unpack. Um, so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question really around um, the Senate bill, if you see implications around coordinated enrollment, I think one of the things that we grapple with um, when we're doing, you know, um, selection and placement for preschool promise um, is pushback from providers if they perceive, you know, a high percentage of kids with IFSPs coming in, let's say, um, just as a way to, like, sort of, there's a, like a little panic, like, we're turning into a special ed classroom type of uh, reaction. And so knowing that, um, you know, we had a great presentation from, um, woman from fact oregon who talked about the difference between the idea and the ada stuff which was really helpful in understanding it but just curious around that piece um 
yeah, if you see that th there will be some kind of implication with how we do enrollment as as the um, as we get to that 2026 date, if anything. I don't know, Anne. I um, if you have thoughts, I mean, I the where I'm I'm, I'm thinking in terms of this that bill itself um we we have a lot of um community engagement that we probably are going to need to really be doing uh with providers and and what this means i think the fact that it made it through the legislature um and and there was definitely some um concerns uh significant concerns around it um but it, sometimes they got Senate Bill 236 and 2166 got confused and tied up together. And um, I think what we're going to need to be most careful of is as we're defining what all of this means um, and what the implications are for providers, I think that's where this is going to either um, uh, have great implications for what providers are willing to do, um, uh, depending on how punitive, uh, 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 for lack of a better term, the, the, the consequences are if they choose to, um, you know, not enroll a child or, or choose to um, tell a family that they can no longer care for them. So I think we've learned a lot from interviews of other states around what their actual, you know, I hope that what we can really uh, define out is something that isn't um, uh, having unintended consequences, which could be people saying, I'm not even going to do care at all. I will never touch okay. public funds. Um, and so I, I don't want to see that in any capacity, but I, mm -hmm. I think we, we have to be careful. We have to be connected uh, to providers. We have to be as upfront as we possibly can about what our intentions are and what the resources will be for them. Um, but I, I am just now, um, you know, that, unaware of exactly how that would fit in with coordinated enrollment as much as it, it's going to be a, it's going to be an issue all the way around with our providers that are, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's preschool promise. It's, I mean, it's the ones that already have essentially a ban in place, but this feels like it makes it more um, mm -hmm. uh, solidified. And so I, I think we're going to have a, a lot of stress in the system and we need to be um, communicating, but Anne, I just keep cutting you off and keep talking. So I'm sure you had other thoughts. No, no, that's, that's totally fine. I mean, I think, um, through, you know, the coordinated enrollment training series that we're kind of currently on, right. We're doing a bit of, um, for preschool promise specifically, like baselining around, you know, IDEA, ADA, like what is this information? I've really heard a lot, um, from, uh, feedback from uh, you all and coordinated enrollment staff about how helpful it would be for, you know, preschool promise providers to have more access to this information too. And I think yeah. where, um, where coordinated enrollment really comes in is, is um, I think around that, like, as we, as we think about including additional publicly funded programming in various stages of enrollment and how um, the community and our public funds really like respond to family voice, family needs and preferences around care. I think this becomes a really like centralizing piece like John just said, where it's not just preschool promise, it's not just any one program, it's how you know our system um, responds to uh, children either exhibiting you know different challenging behaviors um, or with special needs. Um, and so where I think we, we start sort of baselining in this is is through understanding you know what requirements you know there are already at a level and then I think moving into how can um, we think from you know a local or regional level about mm -hmm. the resources that exist currently the resources that might help support this and lead into that much more kind of wrapped around um, resource uh, as needed as things come up. So we've seen this obviously because the ways that we've uh, changed preschool promise enrollment to kind of have more of that regional area and you all as early learning hubs, you know, implementing in some ways the system around this have identified that this is an area of need and support. And so I think what we're, what we're kind of currently doing with 
with a coordinated enrollment piece is to try to start to baseline and then be able to um, use and, and kind of increase um, that resource, that connection and community around serving children um, and, and supporting providers to do so. Mm -hmm. So I think it is in a bit of a way like a, a beginning of a like launch pad, if, if you will, um, mm -hmm. you know that there's there's a lot still to come um, and a lot still needed in terms of resource and, and um, particularly with the preschool promise um, providers uh, being kind of in some cases new to this, you know, no right. suspension, no expulsion. Right. Thank you. I, I'm grinning a little bit because I think you gave me 10 to 15 minutes and then a half hour disappeared. Um, so We're out of time. <laughs> we do have yeah. one last question, John, if you could um, answer. How is the ELD working with Oregon Infant Mental Health Association as part of the work? Um, I, I do know that they were, um, we were trying to get uh, one of two people at uh, the association um, in in the interview pool, but I'm not sure that now, as I saw your question, Lisa, if that occurred, but I see um, a huge need, uh, especially as we're thinking about, you know, here's some recommendations, how do we get to implementation, that implementation phase? I mean, I think they were really trying to stray away. I don't mean this in a, a bad way. We were trying to get away from the conventional, like, um, like even some of our mental health consultation models that exist in our biggest communities, we interviewed them, but, but we were trying to get to like what's working in, in rural areas or what's working for um, communities of color or what's needed and, and really um, uh, didn't, didn't incorporate the usual suspects in. And so I think though, when we get to implementation, mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be uh, obviously critical that the Arim Haas is a part of um, our work. And I, I also think that just PSU and the work they have in the infant toddler mental health graduate kind of mm -hmm. arena over there is is also something that we aren't currently fully connected to. One, and sorry, last thing I'll say about it is at one point we were also, there was funding to support um, a RIMHA to have um, the early childhood uh, mental health endorsement, I mean, to purchase and bring that in. So for the pre-K side of things, so it's not just infant mental health, that was part of our PDG grant. Um, and we haven't gotten to that place yet, but that'd be another area that we need to talk with. Um, okay. well, let me know if you need, let me know if you need any help on that. Um, I need lots of help, Lisa. I know. Um, I think. Well, <laughs> I'm out of here. Oh, <laughs> I think the other uh, piece, just to sort of underscore, I think um, with all of this work, one is, and we've talked about it with Anne specifically around you know, some of the training pieces that are happening. The hubs are here and are seen as supports for providers, but we're not the boss of providers. So I think it's, it's making sure that um, we are our role in the community can be maximized to help to support this, right? Um, and then the other thing, just to make sure that, you know, because I've talked about it with you, John, we've got, we've got a program that is, I've kind of put on the back burner a little bit and I wanna get it off the back burner onto the front burner, but sort of picking up on some of those threads where communities already have some good things going and how can we use this as a springboard to, to make them even better, um, I think would be great. Thanks, Susan. Well, everybody, we did have one more agenda item, but we also want to be respectful of people's time because I think many people have to go on the child care stabilization um, grants. I don't know, Andy and Margie, if there's anything we can just say in one minute quickly. I know we had a little can we bit maybe of send out a written update on yeah. that. Would yeah. that be doable? That I was going to suggest that and I can I can um, collaborate with Don Taylor because really it would be me 
me pretending to be Don Taylor this time instead of pretending to be Tammy Scott uh, and collaborate with her around the communication. I think at a very high level, just be aware that there is a lot of money coming into Oregon around stabilization grants and um, it's gonna have a tight time frame, and there's a lot more information coming, but that there are supports coming and 90% of that money, which I think is somewhere a little over 24, there's a lot of numbers and commas and my computer crashed like five minutes ago and I had it all pulled up and now I can't remember all of the numbers, but it's, it's a lot. Um, okay, it, our 90% um, of that money is going directly to providers. Those who can apply for providers are those who are uh, in our licensing system um, and, and we'll provide more detail around that piece of it. Um, so yeah, I can send all of that out to folks. That's not a problem. Thanks so much, Andy. Appreciate that. We will get that out. Um, to everybody, very exciting. Lots of dollars coming into our state. So that's great. All right. Well, Carmen, unless we have anything else, I think uh, we will bid everyone four minutes late adieu. Thank you um, to all of our presenters today and for all of you hanging in there. There was just a lot to update after the session. You'll be hearing lots from us in the next couple of weeks um, about more on the Learning Collaborative as we kick into high gear, getting ready for that um, for our next meeting. So um, we will Thanks, be. Thanks, everyone. In touch. Thanks all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks.